Today we're going to talk about because God is good, he created us good. That begs a lot of questions, and so we'll answer some of those questions this morning. Because God is good. We look around the world today, we see a lot of brokenness, and we say, God, where are you? If you're good, uh, there's a lot of questions I might have for you because I see a lot of hurt in the world. And then we say, well, because God is good, we're created good. But you might ask the question, well, I see a lot of people doing things that aren't good. So how does this all unpack? So let's get into the message this morning. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you, download the Coastal Church app. All the notes are there. Plus, there's also some amazing bonus material. Every week, a pastor writes a blog. This week, Pastor Kevin wrote a blog on comparing the way the world sees goodness and the way God sees goodness. And uh, you'll want to download the app for that and for all the other things that are there. So take time to do that. We typically don't cover everything in... In the, in, the, in the message, sometimes there's bonus material there that we don't get to, so you'll want to have that handy. There's a, a joke that goes this way. There's a scientist that comes to God, and he's, he's quite proud of all his accomplishments, and he says, God, we, we no longer need you. Uh, we have, uh, we've come so far in our science that uh, we can now clone animals. We could clone humans if we wanted to. We have done all kinds of organ transplants, Things that previously they would have thought were miraculous. Now we're doing that on an everyday basis. We've developed AI. We have that. We no longer need you. We don't have to ask you. We've got AI. It gives us all the things that we need. And we've become transhuman. That's the latest term. We've been transhuman. We're humans that have now uh, tied into this artificial intelligence that we have. And so, God, we no longer need you. We got this. Thank you very much. And God says, oh, you've, you've become like a God then, have you? And yes, yes, we've become that smart. And so... God says, well, let's, let's test all your theory. Why don't we create and make a man the same way I did when I made Adam? And the scientist said, yes, no problem. We can do that. And so he went into his laboratory. And he reached down. And he got some very special organic soil. And he says, okay, God, I'm ready to go. And God says, hey, wait a minute. Get your own dirt. And so... <laughs> See, there's, there's, we, as humans, we think we can make something, but we've always got something to work with. God created what we have out of nothing. And that's because God is outside of time, space, and matter. And he, he is the one who made everything good. If you go back to the story of creation, it's all about God created it good. And that's still God's plan. Even in a broken world, he brings goodness into our world. But the long-term plan is that God wants things to be good. A very simple word, but God wants it to be good. I want to put a couple verses up on the screen for you. Genesis chapter 1, 1. We're going all the way back to the beginning. And then also Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says here, this is the first verse of the Bible. You'll remember it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created it's, we have to understand a very simple point when we go into talking about God is good. And that is God is outside of time, space, and matter. He's the one who decides and defines even what good is. So in the beginning, that's time. He created the heavens, that's space. And then you have earth, which is the matter. In science, they say this is a continuum. You have to have all three come together at the same time. You have to have time, space, and matter all happening at the same time. If you had matter without space, where would you put it? If you had matter without time, when would you put it? It sounds so simple, but God did something here that was so profound when he created this whole universe. And again, God is outside of time, space, and matter. And he's the one that defines the terms for it. This is important because God also is the one who defines the terms for good. When you go through Genesis chapter 1, seven times God says it was good. When he created the the waters, it was good. When he created the animals, it was good. You go through it and you find out that seven times he says it is good. But then when you come down to verse 31, then God saw everything that he had made And indeed, it was what? Very good. What changed it from being good to very good? God only says it was very good after the capstone of his creation, which was humanity. Because we were created in his image. God's image is good. We're created in his image. And we're created 
to be good and to do good. That's what he's created us for because God is a, a good God. God is good, and all the time, God is good. Around the world, there's, a, there's that uh, saying. And so today, again, we emphasize God is good. He created us good. He's outside of time, space, and matter. It was his, his design for goodness, and he's still the one who sets the terms for goodness, if you like. So God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So what's his master plan? God's master plan is for goodness. Now, you might ask the question, can we be good without God? That's an interesting question. That comes up. Could we be good if there wasn't a God, if we didn't know there was God? I propose the answer is we, can, we only can be good because God is good, because he made us good. Well, I thought I would go to... Uh, AI, and I thought I would ask chat GPT, can we be good without God? <laughs> so I thought, let's, let's, ask, let's ask artificial intelligence, can we be good without God? So here's the response. I asked chat GPT. Yes, it is possible to be good without believing in a specific God or subscribing to a particular religious belief. Morality and ethical behavior can be developed and practiced by individuals regardless of their religious beliefs or lack thereof. Many people adhere to a secular moral framework based on empathy, compassion, fairness, and respect for others. Ethics and moral principles can be derived from various sources, including philosophical reasoning, cultural norms, personal experiences, and societal values. People can develop their own moral codes or adopt existing ethical frameworks, such as utilitarianism, genealogy, virtue ethics, consequentialism, among others. So they said, basically, you don't need God to be good. You could develop your own moral code, and you could have your own values. And for many in the world, that's what they believe. I can develop my own code. I don't need God. But I disagree. I think that's artificial intelligence. I don't think that's God intelligence. I believe God is good, and he made mankind good in his image. So any good that is in mankind is because we are rooted in God's goodness. It's his goodness that is coming out of us. Does that make sense? The Bible teaches we're only good because God is good, and he designed us to be good. Whether we realize it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, the goodness that we see is the goodness that comes from God. In Psalm 16, verse 2, here's what the psalmist said. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So the good thing we have, the goodness we have, comes because God is good. Because God is good, we are good. Because God is good, we can be good. It's his goodness that's in with us. Well, someone might ask the question, you Christians believe that your God is good, all love and all powerful. If your God is good and powerful, why doesn't he use his goodness to stop the evil in the world? Because there's a lot of evil in this world. Why doesn't he stop it? That's a good question. Next, we will talk more about because God is good, why is there suffering? But let me just touch on it a little bit today. If we understand that there's evil, that means we are comparing it to something. We then we're acknowledging there must be a good. If there's an evil, then there must be a good. Just as if there's light, I mean, if there's darkness, then you're acknowledging there must be light. So if there's evil, that means there must be good. And if there's good, where did the good come from? Where, did that, where does that those good moral values come from? Well, they come from God. So even the fact that we're questioning it, again, lends to the fact that there, there must be a good God that brought this here to us. We have a conscience. God put a conscience on the inside of us. Before Moses came with the law and wrote the first five books of the Bible, before the law came, they didn't have anything written. So what did God give them? They were living what was called the age of the conscience. And after the law came and the New Testament came, we still have that. 
We still have this conscience on the inside of us. Even a child knows instinctively some things are just wrong. Of course, we have to train the child, but it's within them. They know certain things are just wrong. Interestingly, uh, a number of years ago, I heard of this church that was looking for a pastor. And uh, they had a very interesting way of choosing their pastor. I'd never heard of it before. After all, the search committee did their thing and they interviewed a pastor, the pastor would speak and so forth. What they looked for was how did children respond around that person? If the children were comfortable and excited, they said they, they, they have a sense that there's something good. They said kids can pick up on things. There's, within, even within a child, there's just this consciousness of something good or something bad. Where do we get that from? God wired us for goodness. He, he put that within us. Now, we have to train children. We have to train them. We tell them to mind their manners. We train them in that. We, uh, there's an old term. I don't know if we still use it much today. Mind your P's and Q's. Did anybody get that when they were growing up? Mind, oh, there's a few people. Mind your P's and Q's. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mind your P's and Q's. It's an old English term, and I wasn't sure where it came from. We one time went through a tour of a Shakespearean house, and they said it came from when, when people would go to the tavern and they would be recording the drinks that they had, they, whether they had a pints or quarts. So they said, mind your P's and Q's when you go to the tavern. It might be that. Uh, another person said it comes from typeset because P's and Q's could be uh, interchanged if it's upside down. And so they tell the children to mind your P's and Q's. So it came from that. But any which way, we're, we're taught to, to mind our manners. Uh, not to digress, but I took Cheryl to Washington, D.C. for a tour of the Museum of the Bible. And I learned something I, I never, never thought of before, never heard of. But Gutenberg was the one who printed the Bible. And uh, when we were having a tour there, the person giving us a tour said, uh, this is a little side note, but, you know, in our alphabet, we have uppercase and lowercase letters. He said, do you know where the uppercase and lowercase comes from? I said, I have no idea. Actually, come to think of it, I don't know why we call uppercase and lowercase. He says, well, it's as simple as this. When Gutenberg was printing, he kept the large letters in the uppercase, and he kept the small letters in the lowercase. That's where it comes from, uppercase, lowercase. He says, it's as simple as that. So these things creep into our language, including P's and Q's. Mind your, mind your manners. Be good. So we, we have this built inside of us. This We're wired for goodness, if you like. A number of years ago, I was speaking with uh, a great minister by the name of Dr. Lester Sumrall. And he was sharing with me that he had gone to a number of different places where they'd never had any contact with the good news, the gospel, the Bible. He'd, they'd never heard about God in the light of scriptures. And so when he would go there, he, he said, I, I had to start from square one. I'm speaking to an audience that has no, they've never seen the Bible, they've never heard the story of Jesus, they have no reference to this at all. So where he would start was, he'd have an interpreter with him, he'd brief the interpreter beforehand what he was going to do, but then he would tell the audience, this interpreter here is a bad man. The interpreter, he is going to go after one of your wives tonight, and he's going to steal your wife, and he's going to make love to your wife. That's what this man's going to do. And the people would get upset. they go, no, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. And he, they would say, what they were saying was, in, they knew inherently that is not good. And so from there, he would say, why did you react that way? Why did you say that was wrong? He says, because the God that I'm speaking of in the scriptures, the God who gave us this book, the God who gave us Jesus, is the God who put that on the inside of you. You are wired for good. See, it's there. And I want to explain to you the God who made you and who put that on the inside of you. Because God is good, we're good. He made us for goodness. That was his design. You know, when, when I take a look at my iPad here, it was designed by somebody, and uh, they designed it to, to do good. They designed it to work. They're, they're outside of it. They're not inside. They're running around making it all work. They're, they're outside of that. Even as God is outside of time, space, and matter, they're outside of this, but they designed it to work good. 
And it's wired to do good. I'll put a picture on the screen of a computer board. And it's, it's, the whole thing is in motion to do good. And God puts you in motion to do good. He wired you to do good. So then the question that would be asked, well, if, if God wired us to be good, then what happened? Because there's a lot of evil. There's a lot of brokenness in the world. And we're not always doing good. What happened? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. You know the story. God created man in his image. He showed them what to do to take care of the garden, to tend the garden. He told them not to eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the deceiver, Satan, came along and he gave a message to Eve, a message that was basically undermining, second-guessing God's goodness. That's the trap that he set for Eve, and he's still setting that trap today. One of the basic tactics of our enemy is to come along and use the same approach. Did God really say that is good? Is that really the definition of good? Shouldn't you be able to decide what is good for your life? Shouldn't you set those terms? Why should God set those terms? You should be God. You should set the terms. And so he brought Adam and Eve this lie. It's a package. And I would liken it to, you know, we have a wonderful operating computer system, but then you've been warned, don't open up emails that look suspicious, that are deceptive, and have malware in it, or have a virus in it that could corrupt the operating system of your computer. And if you've mistakenly done that, which I've done, and I've opened it up, and, and I go, oh, no, <laughs> now I have a problem. My, my operating system has become corrupt. It's not working like it used to. It's slowed down. It doesn't function the way it should function. And there's certain things that it should do, good things that it should do, but it's not doing it anymore. What happened? A virus got in. So what do I do? I have to take it down to a computer store and find a savior. <laughs> Please, save my computer. It's broken. It's not working the way it should. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's a struggle. Well, God saw what happened. When Adam and Eve had that, that virus downloaded into them, humanity software, so to speak, became corrupted. Now there's a sin virus. That's why, even though we're created for good, to do good, there's so much brokenness in the world. A sin virus came along and infected what we had. There's a verse in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. It says this, you know how the story of Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, oh, no, we're going to go to Romans chapter 5. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, 12 to 14. I'll start again. You know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. So Adam landed us in this problem. That's how this Sin virus infected humanity through Adam. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So when the law came along, they had a conscience what was right and wrong. But when God spelled it out in his word, then they could clearly see what, was the, what their conscience was telling them. It's important to know that we have to tune our conscience to God. We all have a conscience, but it needs to be tuned to God. Just like you have a tuning fork that tunes a piano, our conscience needs to be tuned to God. It's there for us, but it needs to be tuned to God. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God. That's Satan's objective is to separate us from God. If he can separate us from God, think of it this way, he can separate us from good. But if we're close to God, we're close to good. God is good. So his objective is to separate us from God, separate us from goodness. Let's never forget, his mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. How can he do that? Get us away from God. Get us to, to corrupt even the definitions of goodness. 
So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses, even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God, still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points to the one who will get us out of it. Who gets us out of it? Jesus. He's the one who gets us out of this problem. We're wired for goodness. We came from the factory that way. That's the way God designed us. But when the sin virus got inside humanity, God had a plan all along on how to redeem us, how to get us back to his goodness. We live in a world that says, I want to set my own terms. I want to decide what's good. I don't need God telling me what's good. I, I, and that's rebellion. That's a rebellion. I decide. Recently, I saw advertisements that came up on my news feed for a new Barbie movie. I thought, that's interesting. Uh, I bought a lot of Barbies when I was, uh, as a dad, for three girls, and um, I, I played Barbies with my girls. Yeah, I did. And uh, got down on the floor, and guess who had to be Ken? I was Ken, and, and, we, and Barbie got married a lot of times, and uh, there was a lot of drama with the Barbies, and uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a fun season. Um, playing Barbies with the girls. Yeah, we had Barbie dolls and, and uh, Barbie clothes were all over the floor. And it was, it, it, it was, a, it was, there was a Barbie season in our lives. So I was interested. Okay, there's a Barbie movie coming out. And so I wanted to take a look what it was like. But I, I was surprised because the movie was, in the article, was being praised for deconstructing heteronormative gender roles about toys and colors. One of the actors said, the movie is an encouragement of letting go of the checklist we ascribe to living and living your life and being in your body, your own way, on your own terms. I thought, wow, I don't want my little girl to see that movie. Because <laughs> no, I live, I'm living in this life according to God's terms, not my terms. That's why we say Jesus is Lord of my life. When I say Jesus is the Lord of my life, I say, Lord, I'm living to your terms. I'm not living according to my own terms. Why? Because when I live according to my own terms, I know it leads to death. Because I, God, God's not me. God's good. And he says, I'll, I'll show you what goodness is. And if you live according to my terms, he, he's outside of time, space, and matter. He, he's the one that defines good. And guess what? He doesn't even involve us in the definition process. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, could I get your opinion on this? Should we change this? You know, we've had this for a long time, but I'd like to just get your input on this. Maybe we should define this differently. Let's evolve. This is evolve. This change. And let's, could I get your input? No, he doesn't get our input because he's God. As smart as we are, all that we can do I read an article on transhumanism, and they said, well, we, we are literally making a God. No, you're not. You're not outside of time. You're not out of space. You're not outside of matter. You're not outside. That's foolishness. <laughs> the Bible says, the fool has said there is no God. And the fool has said, I am a God. And that, that's the lie the enemy has tried to perpetrate. You get to be God. You get to set the terms. God's saying, if you do that, I designed it. I designed this world for good. Look at the planets. Look at the stars. Look at this beautiful creation. Even though it struggles because of the fall of man, it's still a fantastic place. It's good. It's a reflection of my goodness. And if you set yourself up as God and you start defining the terms for goodness, it's going to lead to death. Choose life. Choose my goodness. Don't rebel. I've designed goodness. I've designed you to be good. You're wired for goodness. And the only way to live in that goodness is to allow Jesus Christ to come into our life as our Savior and redeem us. So let me talk about how God restores us to his goodness. Number one, God restores our spirit and gives us power over this sin virus. In Romans chapter 8, verses 10 to 13, we, Paul writes this, but if... Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. 
If Christ is in you, even though the sin virus got in and corrupted it, guess what? The Spirit will give life to you because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, what? He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Give life to your mortal bodies. This body that I have right now, I will get a new body when I get to heaven, but this body right now, it says he'll give life to your mortal bodies. He'll, he will help you to keep at bay, to put a firewall against that sin virus because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have no obligation, but it is not to live to the flesh. We have an obligation not to the flesh, but to live according to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, now there's a choice here. If you live according to the flesh, that, that, that virus got in, but we can block it, we can quarantine it. If you, but if you choose to live according to the flesh, he says, you'll die. Oh, I'll make my own terms. I'll do my own thing. He says, well, you're going to die. But look at this. But if by the Spirit, but if by the Spirit, would you say that with me this morning? But if by the Spirit, come on, Richmond, Pitt Meadows, one more time, let's say this together. But if by the Spirit, by the Spirit, by what? By the Spirit, that, 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 that virus got infected. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. So even though we're not in heaven yet, we still struggle with it. God has given us everything we need to live in victory if we choose to let the Spirit guide and lead our lives. Can you see God's goodness in all of this? Yes, we fell. Yes, there's all sin and fallen short of his glory. Yes, we're born into this. But God says, I've got a solution. The Holy Spirit will help you. And by the Spirit, you can have the fruit of the Spirit. The goodness can come through your life because that's what you're designed to do. And that's the best life to live. That's the good life, allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you. But you have to make that choice. Let the Holy Spirit be in charge of your life. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. What is he saying there? He's saying, it's a daily choice. God, I submit to you. I submit to your terms of goodness. I submit to your life. I submit to your word. So God restores our spirit and gives us power over the sin virus. Then Jesus produces his goodness in us. John chapter 15, remain in me as I also remain in you. That's a choice. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. One of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. This goodness that we're wired for flows out of our life as we're abiding in Jesus, as we're meditating, thinking about doing what you're doing this morning, being in church, being in life group, praying, spending time thinking about the goodness of God. Say, God, I'll live by your terms, not by my terms then goodness is produced in your life. It's a fruit. And as Christians, it's really our, our duty to do this. Jesus said, you can sum this all up by two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And as Christians, those commandments really should be the manifestation of goodness. Because of that, we should be generous. We should promote equality. We should stand against evil. We should stand against hatred, abuse, discrimination, and oppression. Where should this come from? It should come from the fact that we have been wired for goodness by God, and now the Holy Spirit, even though sin has come into this world, by God's goodness, by his spirit within us, we can live this out. We can be the what? Good Samaritan. That's, what, that's who we're called to be. Because God is good, we're good. He's living within us. He's wired us for goodness. Lastly, this is good news. God will give us a new body that will never be infected again by sin. Boy, that's so encouraging. A couple of verses I just want to close with on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. May these scriptures just encourage your heart today. We have, we have a future to look forward to. Here Paul writes, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, one day it's going to expire. That is when we die and leave this earthly body. 
Notice you, you're still alive. You've just left this, this tent, this earth suit. We'll have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. It's going to be pretty exciting. You're going to get a new body. No more headaches. No more wrinkles. Look out. <laughs> new body. Just saying. Yeah, we grow weary in our present bodies. Yeah, we do. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by his life. If sin hadn't infected us, we, they would never die. But sin came into this world. God himself has prepared us for this. Now, I like this part. And as a guarantee, guarantee. So can you guarantee I'll get a new body? God already guaranteed it. Guaranteed. How, what's the guarantee? What's the down payment? The Holy Spirit. You've experienced the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, Baptize the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit. And God's saying, I gave you the Holy Spirit. He's at work in your life. He's helping you to do good, helping you keep sin at bay. But there's more coming. You're going to get a new body. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. For we know the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Is creation groaning and laboring right now? Absolutely. Every day it's in the news. Look what's happening. This earth is groaning. Why? Because sin came in. Not only that, but we also have the first fruit of the Spirit, this down payment. Even we ourselves, we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Isn't that your biggest battle, your flesh versus your spirit? Isn't that your biggest fight? Your body, our old nature wants to do something, but you know your new nature, you have to make that choice over and over again every day. We are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for why it is one still hope for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So God's been with us in this present time. He's with us. He lives within us. He helps us to live and to do good. But he wants us to know that there's more coming. You have a new body. You never will be affected or wrestle with the consequence of sin again. Praise God. Praise God. You know what I like? I like the fact that I can know God personally. I can know him myself. In 1969, I was a little boy, and they landed on the moon. It would have been July, right about this time that they landed on the moon. And we had an old black and white TV, and some of our neighbors didn't have television, so they all showed up. Our driveway was filled with cars, and people were coming in, and they sat down in our living room, and we were all excited. We gathered around that little black and white TV, and we watched Neil Armstrong step onto the moon, and it was pretty exciting. I'll never forget that day. I, I, I've always been curious about space. Uh, I watched the movie Apollo 13, read books on space, and, but I've never been to space. Other than flying in a plane, that's as close as I've got. I've never been to the moon. Never been there. But vicariously, I've been there. By books and reading, by watching. I feel like I've been there. I've, I've tasted. But that's only secondhand knowledge. I've never been there. I've, not like Neil Armstrong. He's been there. He's personally been there. Where are you going with this, Pastor? Here's where I'm going. Some people just know God on a secondhand basis. They've heard about God, read a book about God. But they've never personally experienced the God of the Bible. Your grandfather told them about God, somebody else. But I have a message for you today. This good God, you can know him personally. It's a personal Jesus, my personal Jesus. Yeah. So I want to pray with you today. If you don't know God, God is good. He made you for goodness. He'll help you in, your, in this life you're living to live good, but he's got good things in store for you. So how does that happen? Very simple. You simply ask God to come into your life. God is a spirit. You're a spiritual being. And his spirit and your spirit mesh and they become one. And he, your spirit is perfectly recreated. And this Christian life is from the inside out. And so he would like to start that with you today. So at our campuses online here this morning, I'm going to invite you to 
pray a simple prayer with me. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I open up my heart. God, I, I acknowledge you're a good God. You sent your son Jesus to die for my sins. He rose again so I could have life. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart today. Amen.